time you want, basically. But that's what I'm saying. Oh, so we're we're live now? Uh, you're yeah, you're live now. Oh, well then, hi everybody. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's it's a strange feeling uh, addressing a, 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 a screen, so I'll do my best to uh, make it look uh, lively. But I appreciate uh, I appreciate the work that's gone into uh, putting this conference together. So let me let's start the evening off on a high a high note. Good evening, my fellow environmentalists. I say that with full pride and confidence because we all wouldn't be here tonight doing the work we do if we took our municipalities, our state, and our planet for granted. My name is Simon Skolnick, and I'm the president of the New York State Association of Conservation Commissions, known more quickly as NISAC, that is celebrating its 50th anniversary conference on the environment. Our opening speaker tomorrow morning, Assembly Member Steve Otis, who is with us tonight, will talk about what NISAC's 50 years have meant to our state. I will give proper acknowledgement to the Westchester County Conservation Commission members and sustainability committee members who put in countless hours, day and night, to put this conference together at tomorrow morning's opening portion of our conference. But I do want to say that we gave very serious consideration as to how we wanted our conference to open. And there was no other choice but to start it with this legislative roundtable. Wow, I wish I could say as I look around me, but it is what it is. <laughs> You know, I'm looking at very, very, very wonderful people, but not in person. Um, I do want to say that we gave um, a lot of consideration to, the, to uh, how this uh, process would start. And I wanted to also say how fortunate can our state be to have such dedicated public servants from all corners of New York who work tirelessly to protect our state's natural environment. So not, enough of this speechifying. You came here to meet our legislators, hear from them directly about what is happening environmentally statewide. I'm extremely happy to introduce them. We have Assemblyman Steve Engelbright from District 4, which covers the North Shore of Suffolk County. Assemblyman Engelbright is chair of the New York State Assembly Committee on Environmental Conservation. We have Senator Pete Harcum, New York State District 40, which covers parts of Westchester, Putnam, and Dutchess counties. And he's the chairman of the Committee on Alcoholism and Substance Abuse, which I can understand I could use some of that abuse tonight, quite honestly. We also have Ashley Dougherty, Legislative Director to New York State Senator Todd Kaminsky, District 9, South Shore of Nassau County, who's the chair of the Senate Environmental Conservation Committee. By the way, that's my, my, my home district when I was living on Long, Long Island. I lived in Valley Stream, so I have an attachment to uh, the District 9. We also, I'm very ha happy to have Dr. Anna Kellis, a New York State Assembly member from District 125, Central New York State, Thompsons County, and the Southwest of Cortland County. And finally, we have Steve Otis, New York State Assembly member of District 91, and the Long Island Sound Towns, New Rochelle to Portchester and Westchester County, and also a board member of NISAC. Uh, so, I'd like just to go over the procedure, what we're gonna be following tonight. Each of our speakers will uh, provide an opening remark and then you will have the opportunity to ask your questions. I will be assisted tonight by John Rhodes, who's also a board member of NISAC. And I'm gonna open the uh, questions by first asking um, assembly member, Steve Engelbright and uh, Ashley Dougherty uh, regarding uh, their most, what they felt was the most important environmental accomplishment this session. So I'll, I'll go first with, um, with uh, Assembly Member uh, Engelbright. Oh, very good, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your invitation and uh, all the work that you do. Um, I, I would uh, just wanna mention uh, parenthetically, I was on the Brookhaven Town Conservation Advisory Council for the better part of 10 years uh, uh, back at a time when I had brown hair and <laughs> it was somewhat younger, but it was important work. And I had some sense of uh, the value uh, of the combined uh, effort that uh, all of you who are participating here this evening and in this conference uh, into tomorrow um, uh, contribute to uh, the 
protection of uh, the state's environmental resources, and I salute you and, and thank you for your good work. Uh, the most important things uh, for this year that I want to mention in uh, this short time uh, that I'll, I'll have a chance to, to speak is that we have the, the Green Amendment on the ballot uh, uh, this year. Uh, that uh, is a, uh, a chance for us to amend the state constitution uh, to uh, make um, uh, the uh, right to clean air, clean water, and a healthful environment a part of uh, uh, the basic rights of being a citizen in the state. And uh, so I, I would encourage you all to do within your jurisdictions uh, to do all that you can to help get the vote out uh, to uh, make sure that this passes uh, for a number of reasons. The obvious first reason is because it's really important to elevate environmental protection uh, to the same level as freedom of association and uh, freedom of speech uh, and other constitutional rights. Uh, when we formed our nation, we didn't really anticipate uh, that environment was uh, going to, there, was, there, there would be a need for uh, the environment to be a part of the Constitution. But today, uh, our uh, environment is under siege and uh, along with it, the health and well-being of our citizens. And uh, I think it's appropriate that we uh, encourage uh, passage of uh, the Green Amendment. And I encourage each of you to participate in that. And another reason for that is because it's a set in place uh, for uh, the Environmental Bond Act, which will be next year. Uh, so in answer to your question, uh, what is the most important environmental uh, accomplishment in this session, I would have to point toward uh, this uh, uh, Green Amendment and uh, the uh, Environmental Bond Act. And uh, our new governor has enhanced the uh, expectation of uh, its benefits by uh, raising it to a $4 billion authorization. Uh, that's money that we're going to need if we're going to meet the challenges of uh, climate change and uh, all of the conservation needs of the state. So we need a, a, a reservoir of uh, a goodwill uh, within our citizenry to be translated into a, uh, a reservoir of uh, actual dollars uh, that we can draw upon uh, to do uh, many of the important projects around the state. Uh, for everything from waterfront revitalization uh, to uh, protecting uh, drinking water and uh, uh, providing for recharge stations uh, for uh, uh, the uh, automobiles and uh, trucks uh, that will be running on electricity instead of uh, gasoline, uh, hopefully in the near term. I've had the pleasure of uh, being the chair of the Environmental Conservation Committee since 2015. And uh, I focused in that time on a wide range of issues, uh, including the Environmental Protection Fund. I would like to see it enhanced uh, and enlarged in the next year. But I just want to say, as uh, I yield to the uh, presence of Ashley Doherty, that uh, it's been uh, a, a tremendous uh, privilege to work with uh, Todd Kaminsky. I know he's up to his ears in alligators these days as he's running for office uh, this year as well. Um, but he is uh, a, a, a model uh, for getting things done um, and uh, understanding the importance of emphasizing environmental matters. Um, uh, within uh, the scope of, of all of his activities. So uh, once again, uh, Simon Skolnick, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, let me yield at this point uh, back to you. Okay, uh, so I, I sort of I sort of strangled the beginning already by uh, by asking the question before the introduction. So let's I'll I'll I'll, 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 I'll let's stay, stay with that thought. So Ashley, I'll I'll, I'll let you uh, give your uh, opening statements and then uh, please address the question. 
Well, I'm going to, maybe it'd be easier to um, quickly address the question if that's okay. I can do it pretty That's quick. fine. Just while it's in my head, I would say the, I'm, we're in total agreement. Getting the Bond Act across the finish line this year in the budget is huge. That will be a big lift next year on the ballot. And, you know, hope, you know, the new governor has supported it and has also stated about the interest of increasing it. There hasn't been funding like that before. And it will go a great way towards, you know, also urban heat jungles, greener schools, water, infrastructure, you know, sewers, you know, out in Long Island, I know is a hot topic and everything we're facing with climate change, the time is now to make those type of investments. And then I also know my, you know, the Senator would definitely want to mention, you know, the work he did with Assemblyman Engelbright on the Family and Firefighter Protection Act. We're very close to being the first state in the entire United States to ban the most dangerous flame retardants from electronic displacers. There's only the European Union's done that. We're probably going to join in with mattresses and, you know, um, other furniture. That's about 13 other states, but that will go a long way in protecting children, our families, and, you know, our firefighters from being harmed from this. And we're hopeful the governor will be signing it soon. Um, but I would say those are two, you know, big accomplishments. There's been a lot this year. But I do want to say thank you for, you know, inviting our office here today and congratulations on your 50th anniversary. As has been told, I work with Senator Kaminsky and I serve as his legislative director and council and also have the pleasure of working with the Environmental Conservation Committee uh, due to his role as a chair. As we all know, we're currently under the threat of climate change and I think everyone recognizes we need to take steps to preserve our environment and our earth for not just our generation, the ones to come, and then the generations after that, you know, luckily the state has already taken bold actions by passing the CLCPA, but there's more we can do from improving our recycling systems to decreased waste and emissions to prioritizing open space conservation efforts through things like 30 by 30 or improving wetland protection. And right now we really depend on the environment to bring us joy from recreation or hiking or fishing, but also everything's like food, clean water, regulating disease, you know, pollution, sequestering, healthier, you know, air. So it's important we recognize that. And through that, I know we're here at, you know, your guys conference and we can obtain a lot of that through managing open space programs, protecting our community's natural green infrastructure and providing places for recreation in, you know, populated areas. And I know there's more to do and the Senate and the assembly has done a lot this year, but a lot of excitement to for next year and you know the different ballot initiatives and we continue to look forward to what the state will do to combat climate change thank and you thank you again for having us thank you um uh, i'd like to uh, then go to uh uh senator harkham uh uh within let's revert back to what i had originally intended <laughs> please give your opening remarks and we'll continue that way and then we'll go to a question Thank you, Simon. We we roll easy, so it's all good. Thank you so much for the invitation, and, and thank you to NYSAC and, and Chairman Engelbright and Chairman Kaminsky. We have, we're so fortunate to have two such great environmental leaders in both houses, and to Steve and Anna, my, my friends and colleagues who we work with closely. Um, it's really great to be here, and, and special thanks to NYSAC. Um, you know, Simon had asked me to comment on some environmental challenges in my district, which is sort of lower, lower Hudson Valley. And, you know, obviously climate change is, is there with everybody. A um, couple of examples, since 2008, when I was first elected to the Westchester County Board and started working on storm recovery, we've had to rebuild the electric grid in Northeast Westchester four times due to 100 year storms that, that came every year, every four years, and that's not to, to mention the localized devastation um, year after year after year. In my district, we're spending $60 million to elevate a section of the Sawmill River Parkway because of flooding and rising sea levels make it much harder for the Sawmill River, river itself to drain. Um, so, so these are the kind of impacts that we're seeing on a daily basis, you know, not to mention the, the, the tragic deaths of five people in Westchester, you know, during, during um, Ida. So, you know, the, the impacts are here. Some of them are a little more subtle and, and are exacerbating other challenges. 
Um, I represent the east of Hudson watershed, provides a drinking water to a million people, the backup water source for all of New York City. And phosphorus is, is a massive issue. Um, you know, excess phosphorus, a lot of it comes from leaking septic systems. Um, it causes blue-green algae, causes eutrophication. Um, but part of that is exacerbated by climate change because phosphorus lays dormant on, on the base of the lakes and the ponds. But when the water temperature heats up, it releases a phosphorus, creating the blue-green algae, providing nutrients for invasive species. Um, and this is a massive, massive challenge, not just in my district, but all across New York State. And we really need to get a handle on some kind of a plan for blue-green algae. And, and Steve Otis and I are working on one aspect of that together. Uh, on the climate side, um, Chairman Engelbright and I passed a bill this year that Governor Hochul signed into law um, that will, will require all, all vehicles sold or leased uh, in New York be zero emissions by 2035. That was a huge win. And, and thanks to Ashley and Todd um, for all of their help in getting that across, but, but that was a big win. Um, and that will help signal to the marketplace exactly what Steve was talking about, that we need to ramp up our charging infrastructure. Um, I've got a similar bill with power lawn equipment um, much shorter time frame. We just introduced that five years. And then lastly, the, 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 the other real environmental challenge of many that I'd like to talk about in my district is the decommissioning and the safety commissioning of Indian Point. And in the CLCPA, we talk about a just transition. Well, we're kind of writing the textbook for that as we, as we go along. And part of that was some of the legislative things that we did, the creation working with the former governor of the decommissioning oversight board, because quite frankly, um, nobody really trusts the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to do that. So it's a combination of state agencies, nuclear experts, environmentalists, and elected officials who will be on the ground overseeing that process. And we talk about environmental justice communities the village of Buchanan will be a de facto nuclear waste site forever because the federal government never got its act together on waste site. And so what are we going to do for economic redevelopment when you've got casks and casks and casks of spent uh, nuclear fuel there? So a lot of challenges going on, um, but I, you know, I feel very energized. We have great leadership, as I mentioned. Uh, on, on both committees. You have so many um, legislators in both houses who are committed to working on these issues. And um, I'm just excited for the conversation this evening. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, I guess we'll go next with uh, Assemblywoman, Dr. Anna Kellis, uh, opening remarks and a response uh, to the question of what do you think uh, was the most important environmental accomplishments this session? And you're muted. <laughs> uh, no, I'm here. I, uh, I actually, Steve will appreciate this. I um, was just speaking to uh, one of the main authors of, um, of a scientific journal article that, um, that, that really was the, the impetus of the CLCPA, um, Dr. Jacobson, and he uh, will hopefully be speaking next Wednesday. Um, so that is helpful. Um, and I will now explain what I mean by that. Um, but uh, to address some of the accomplishments this year, um, some of them are, are finished wins. Uh, some of them are, are progress in motion. Um, one of the big ones uh, that, that we had in my local area, but I think it's really important um, because it shows uh, both the impact of local community outreach um, and, and also how uh, that impact can really influence state decisions. So there uh, was, uh, there's a huge property of land on uh, Cayuga Lake uh, waterfront. It includes a long stretch of waterfront um, and then expands into agricultural land. And um, there was a negotiation between the Finger Lakes Land Trust and NYSEG that was the owner of that land for years um, and then all of a sudden, you know, announcement was put out that it was going up for auction to be uh, developed for residential purposes. 
um, this would have been a, a huge loss of um, several hundred, I think up to 500 um, feet of waterfront property and, um, and virgin forest lands, uh, but also uh, it is home for several endangered plant species uh, and one of the main uh, forest land tracks in this area for um, four bird species that have been identified to be on, on decline. Uh, and there was a huge outreach by the community. We had about 4,500 uh, community members send emails to the PSC, uh, Governor Hochul. Um, it was a bipartisan issue. Um, Senator uh, Helming and myself, we sent uh, a letter um, to the governor and to the PSC and the DEC. Um, and two weeks ago, uh, the uh, NYSEG announced that they were withdrawing um, the public hearing and that they would resume negotiations with Finger Lakes Land Trust to preserve that land. Uh, uh, Finger Lakes Land Trust will be purchasing it uh, in, in the name of the DEC. DEC will then purchase that and it'll hopefully be become state forest land. Um, and that is a huge win for the whole state. Um, so that is one. Um, another thing that I worked on uh, and that Steve um, Engelbright supported me on uh, in the budget, which was a bigger win than people realize, uh, was um, a couple of years ago, the funding for the soil health program at Cornell was cut in half. Uh, and this year, um, I uh, put forward a proposal to bring that back to whole um, in, in the budget, which, um, which it was, and that was included in the final budget. And why this is important uh, is because we, we now know that we will probably end up being the breadbasket for the United States again uh, in the next you know, 10, 20 years, given climate change. And it is extremely important that we preserve our agricultural soil uh, in a, because it is one of the uh, sources of soil sequestration. It's the skin of the earth. And uh, having sustainable agricultural practices is critical. And that's what the soil health study does. It evaluates the impact of practices and also uh, both the impact of conventional agriculture as well as the impact on soil quality um, for sustainable practices, various sustainable practices like low-till, no-till, uh, cover crops, rotation. Um, those are just to name a few, really a few of a large uh, group of things that they study. Uh, so that was a huge win. Um, just to note uh, for anybody who hasn't studied soil health, uh, and I nerd out on it all the time, is that an inch of soil, which is a, a living organism, if you really understand it, takes about 100 to 500 years to, to build, to create. Uh, the current uh, uh, industrial uh, conventional agriculture, it takes up to 50 to 60 years to completely uh, destroy the soil. Um, so so this, is, this is big. This is huge. Um, another uh, thing that I have focused on, um, and it's still in motion, and something that, that uh, people know uh, of me and an obsession of mine is cryptocurrency mining. Um, so I have uh, brought forward a bill that would put a moratorium on cryptocurrency mining in power plants uh, that use fossil fuels. And it would also require the DEC to do a full environmental impact assessment. And the reason that I consider this a win is because January of this year, no one was talking about cryptocurrency and certainly not cryptocurrency mining or really understanding the difference. Um, and now I, you know, I can have savvy conversations with almost all of my colleagues. Um, it has uh, you know, gone all over the world as a hot topic. Um, and, and most importantly, um, we have one of the first cryptocurrency mining companies that has purchased a power plant. So for anybody who really, really quickly that doesn't understand uh, cryptocurrency, it's a digital currency um, using blockchain technology. And blockchain is just blocks of information uh, that each have a, a unique identifier. It's uh, held in a large ledger. The most important thing about it is it's decentralized and instantaneous exchange of information. Um, in those blocks, you can have any information, exchange of, um, exchange of medical data, exchange of educational data, or an exchange of a currency, buying and selling of a currency. But those transactions need to be validated. Just like when you stick your card in an ATM machine uh, and the first thing it asks is a PIN code, right? It wants you to validate you are who you say you are. And then you can interact with it. Well, in digital currencies, they have to validate those transactions too. But they are not uh, governed by a, a government or banks. So they have to be validated by the users. And there are different methods to validate those transactions. 
Um, and that's where the crux of cryptocurrency is really important, understanding that. Because there are different methods to validate transactions. There's proof of work, proof of stake, proof of space, proof of time. There's, there's many different types. It just so happens that proof of work is the only one that's competitive in nature, meaning that there's a, there's a mathematical equation assigned to each transaction and people compete with each other to solve that mathematical equation. And whoever does wins currency. Instead of buying it or selling it, they win it. But that equation gets harder over time and there's no software that can be designed to, to get an edge over solving that equation over anybody else, which means the only way you can solve it is having more computers. That's the issue. And that's where this business, this industry developed where people consolidate more and more and more and more and more computers running 24 seven to get an edge over other people to win currency, um, which means they use an insane amount of energy, a lot of water, right? A lot of things, a natural resources to power those computers. Uh, so they try and minimize their electrical costs. And one of the, the, the smartest ways to do that if you don't really care about the environment is to just buy your own power plant. So old retired power plants are being bought up, turned back on, running 24 seven, 365 days out of the year to give an advantage. And it just so happens the first one in the country was on Seneca Lake. So it pulls in 130 million gallons of water a day at about 40 to 60 degrees temperature. And it can spit it back out into a class C trout stream at about 86 degrees temperature in the summer and about 108 degrees temperature in the winter. Um, trout show signs of stress and start dying at 70 degrees. Um, and so it is uh, very consumptive of natural resources and they earn about eight coin a day, win about eight coin a day, which is about $440,000 for them. Um, they're doubling their computer capacity by December, which means they will earn about a million dollars a day. And, um, and they give the local community um, a very small amount of that. In fact, about the amount of money that they can make in a day. Uh, so they're buying us for cheap and they're making a tremendous amount of money that they sell on the international market. Um, people now understand that everybody is talking about it and that is a huge movement forward uh, where previously, you know, I had legislators who asked me, is that a computer game? Where now people understand this is a really big deal. This is the equivalent this, of the new age of natural gas extraction. This is the digital virgin version of natural gas extraction. And it is happening right here in the Finger Lakes. Why? Because we have cool temperatures, we have the cleanest air, and we have free fresh water, surface water. We are one of the last places on the planet that has fresh water, surface fresh water. So this is now or never. This bill uh, made it through, one, through, through the Senate. Uh, it didn't make it through the assembly. The argument is that it creates jobs, it's high tech, it's moving tech into the industry, into the state. Truth is it doesn't create jobs. It uses a lot of natural resources and, um, and it's not a, a, an answer to climate change, uh, which is one of the arguments which I can certainly answer if people have questions. So um, I'm hoping it'll pass this coming year um, because it will create a moratorium on any new facilities. The reason it's important is because there are, um, there are others that are following suit. There's another facility uh, trying to open up on, uh, right outside of Buffalo. And there are about 28 other retired power plants in upstate New York that could be targets next. There are another three um, that I know of that are working in that direction. So this is extremely time sensitive. Um, so we've gone from zero to 60. We need to get to 100 in the next couple months. Um, we need this to pass in January, but it's a huge win because the world is looking. I've been getting interviews nationally, internationally, uh, calls from federal legislators uh, who are now looking at what we're doing in New York State. We will set the trend in New York State when we need to do it. So it's a huge win to get it on everyone's radar and get as far as we've done in six months. And I'm very excited about it. Thank you. Uh, one of the uh, comments, thank you very much. One of the comments was that uh, Anna crushes it. So uh, I guess you have uh, some fans out there. Uh, we, just as an aside, we had uh, discussed with, uh, with uh, Dr. Kellis uh, the opportunity of doing a, a workshop. I think she, we, we, we just got that workshop, so I appreciate that very much. Um, uh, last but not least is, uh, is uh, Steve Otis, who I uh, have known, I don't know, how long has it been, Steve? 30, 30 years or something in that neighborhood? Uh, Steve, besides all his accomplishments, is a board member of NISAC. 
um, and will be our opening speaker at tomorrow's uh, session. So uh, again, uh, Steve, uh, welcome, and uh, please uh, open remarks and, uh, and and please respond to the uh, original question of what uh, you thought was the most uh, uh, important environmental accomplishments uh, of this session. Well, it's great to be here and uh, with uh, partners because uh, we have our Senate partners. Uh, 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 Steve Engelbright does a great job chairing the Environmental Conservation Committee in the Assembly. Um, and Anna, uh, I've worked closely with on, on a, a few issues. Um, I, I think one of the highlights and everything that everyone has mentioned, I'm not gonna repeat those highlights, but they're, they're certainly there. Um, I think the thing that, that um, one of my favorite issues and, and an issue that everybody has touched on and brings us together is uh, the variety of very important water issues. And it's something I think everybody on on, on the panel today has worked on and, and I've interfaced with. Um, but uh, when I first joined my local conservation commission um, in the late 80s, I, I used to say in the 80s that water was the issue of the 80s and no one really paid attention. But today I do think people get it that, that water issues are, are paramount. And so I, one of the other highlights in this legislative session, and it is something that uh, the legislature and uh, the governor have been strong on for a number of years is doing a lot more about uh, water issues around the state. We have in this year's budget a new $500 million commitment towards clean water programs. Um, there was a mention in one of the questions about emerging contaminants um, and a big increase in state money towards emerging, emerging contaminants issues um, all over the state, a lot of it on Long Island, um, and uh, very positive. But we have now um, uh, really the most um, generous grant program in the state um, of uh, clean water grants uh, that go to every corner of the state, very important. So that was sort of one of the big, big victories. But the water issues come in, um, in a lot of places, we're all working on wetlands issues, Pete Harkham is uh, working on that. Steve Engelbright is working on that and trying to improve our wetland protection. Um, I am uh, very involved in the cryptocurrency mining issue with, uh, with Anna Kellis and uh, actually went to school in the Finger Lakes. And, and one of the interesting issues about Anna mentioned um, saving this property um, on Lake Cayuga and the opportunity there. One of the issues in the Finger Lakes, a water quality issue is increasing runoff and what is that doing to the water quality in the Finger Lakes. And so uh, these are, there are many aspects to the clean water issues. I'm going to mention one, uh, Steve Engelbright mentioned our Environmental Bond Act, which is supposed to be on the ballot uh, last year and it wasn't because of COVID, it's going to be on the ballot next year. One of the things that the legislature added is um, $100 million dollars for a new grant program for stormwater grants to municipalities. And what we went through with the recent storms that Pete Harkin mentioned and the damage is we realized that our municipalities need help on their stormwater management. And so uh, my hope is that maybe we can jumpstart that program in this year's state budget, even in advance of the bond issue, because there's an urgency towards local governments needing help, um, not just what they're getting now, which is grants for drinking water and for uh, their uh, sanitary sewer systems. They need help now with storm, st stormwater management funds. Uh, so I think that that's the highlight I'll talk about. I'm gonna mention one other issue, which uh, is uh, something that the legislature weighed in on that is important, especially to our audience of Conservation Commission members and local uh, local environmental advocates, sustainability committee folks, is that in the Environmental Protection Fund, uh, we added uh, make sure that there's money in there for um, municipal recycling, which is an important thing at the local level. We added money for municipal parks, uh, and uh, and we also have and I'll mention one other issue. We have some money, but we need to do a lot more, and this is something that. Steve Engelbright, uh, I know, is very concerned about, and I chair a committee on science and technology, which is electric charging stations in this state. We're going to be moving to electric vehicles very quickly. All the manufacturers are going to be doing it. 
And we do not currently have the charging station infrastructure to meet the demand that's gonna be there for these vehicles. And transportation emissions are a big part of our climate change challenge. And what we're gonna to have to do to meet our targets we need to provide uh, the infrastructure around the state so that people can buy electric vehicles with confidence and get them charged uh, comfortably wherever they go, not feeling like they're going to get uh, um, stranded or they're going to show up to a charging station that's on a map and there's going to be a line of vehicles uh, ahead of them. So these are issues that everybody on, on the panel is, is working on. Uh, and uh, I would say from a conservation commission level, um, this is something that if you're on a conservation commission, you should be speaking to or a sustainability committee to your local governments and your local businesses to see what they can be doing to uh, increase the deployment of charging stations right where, where, where people uh, live. So those are my opening comments, but I love being on here with, with all of my good friends. Sami, you're muted. Simon, you're muted still. There Sorry you. about that. Uh, this is a question that came yeah, uh, from one of the attendees. Uh, question for all the legislators. New York passed the CLCPA to much celebration, but since then the Public Service Commission is conducting business as usual, continuing to allow fossil fuel infrastructure to be constructed with ratepayer dollars. Utilities won't shift to renewables without being forced. Will you support holding a legislative hearing to investigate why the PSC is not making actionable plans to move New York off fossil fuels in line with the CLCPA? And I guess let's, I guess it's all only fair to start where we started uh, originally with uh, uh, Assemblyman Engelbright. Uh, did, did you get the gist of the question, sir? Yes, I got the gist of the question. I am. Um... Uh, very concerned uh, that uh, we see uh, sort of the selective response uh, to uh, the black letter law and the intent of the legislature uh, regarding climate change. And uh, uh, we are looking at it at increasingly uh, a bleak uh, future if we do not uh, meet the goals and uh, certainly uh, the, uh, the uh, way that we can remedy this uh, is to hold uh, the administrative entities of state government uh, to uh, the letter of the law. The way to do that is to make them feel very self-conscious. Uh, and I am uh, very comfortable with the idea of uh, holding hearings uh, uh, just to make sure that uh, uh, there is administrative uh, compliance. I would uh, point out that we have a new governor who uh, uh, I believe uh, is going to hear about this issue uh, during this re-election season. Um, I think that she uh, is uh, likely to also have uh, a more uh, strict adherence to uh, the goals uh, than perhaps uh, the previous governor did. Uh, at least I'm, I'm hoping that's the case. But uh, uh, certainly I am uh, very interested in, in holding hearings from time to time just to make sure that we're on track with respect to the goals and the uh, processes leading to uh, compliance uh, with the CLCPA. Um. Ashley Dougherty, same question. Uh, again, I, it's a long question, but do you, I, I, I can repeat it or if you've got the- No, yeah, I can be quick on this one. I mean, sure. as said, we do have a new governor and you know, Governor Hochul has already taken a lot of action. You know, as we saw with Climate Week, making strategic investments and you know, even so quickly, I think it was so quick, he signed the 2035 electric, you know, Senator Harcum's bill, which was huge. That was one of the earliest ones he signed. And we also have to look to the fact that she already made changes to the commission. We now have um, Commissioner Rory Christian, who has a background in a lot of these areas. And, you know, sometimes you 
you also want to give an administration time to grow to see what changes they make. But as we all know, you know, hearings are a great way to get more information to really drive into the details and to also allow a level of public participation and to create that level of transparency. So I think that would be, I know there's it's really hearings and you know, new administration, but I, I do think it is interesting to see what the commission will do now with a little bit of change up that has occurred recently. All right, uh, Senator Harkum. Thank you. Um, you know, certainly agree with, with but both Steve and Ashley said, new membership on the PSC, new governor. Um, but there's also legislation in both of our houses, several pieces dealing with um, gas powered plants, as well as frack gas infrastructure. And so I'm hoping collaboratively that we can take some action along that front, because we do have some legislative ability and authority to curtail some of this, um, you know, both from a greenhouse gas perspective, but a public safety perspective. You know, at Indian Point, we have a, a highly pressurized frack gas pipeline 150 feet from a nuclear reactor control room, you know, 200 feet from an elementary school. So, you know, had FERC done its job and the NRC done its job, you know, it might not be there, but but this is what we're stuck with now in New York State is this gas infrastructure. And we need to be careful not to allow more in because there's a 30 year bond payment to these pipelines at a minimum. So any project we allow to come in, we're stuck with that for the next 30 to 40 years. So we really need a moratorium on the infrastructure as well. Simon, you're muted. Should have a voice actuated unmuting button feature. <laughs> you know. <laughs> All right. Same question to Assembly Member uh, Kellis, please. Nope. You're muted now. <laughs> you're muted. <laughs> there you go. I tried to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I was actually answering in the uh, Q and A uh, some of those questions. So if you could just summarize the question for me. Sure. Um, basically, um, they're saying that the CLCPA uh, was, you know, really a, a, a landmark uh, a law that was passed, but uh, our uh, New York State Public Service Commission is really uh, not. Uh, um, they're say, stating that it's uh, uh, continuing business as usual. Uh, they're allowing fossil fuel infrastructure to be constructed with ratepayer dollars. It, it, basically, utilities won't ship to renewables. And uh, basically, they're asking, you know, what is the state going to do about that? Uh, do, do you sense that uh, that's a, a true, by the way? Do, do you all do you agree with the, uh, the, the speaker's uh, position? Is yeah, I have been concerned, um, similarly concerned. I think that uh, one of the most important things that we all need to be holding, um, hold us accountable as a legislator. I am the state, so hold me accountable. Hold, hold the, the, the departments accountable. Um, the CLCPA passed. Uh, Section 7 of, uh, of the CLCPA requires that, um, that we, for example, look at the... Um, the full uh, um, process from when uh, the the oil and gas was is extracted all the way through to when it's used, we have to uh, consider the entire emissions from that entire process, upstream process that's supposed to be included in our evaluation um, of the impact, uh, greenhouse gas impacts of these projects. Um, we are not seeing that that is happening in consistently as an example. So, um, you know, we need these, uh, just for starters, we need these projects. Um, when they put proposals in, they have to explain how they are compliant with the CLCPA. And they need to be evaluated based on, um, based on section seven of the CLCPA. Do they meet all of those standards? I think that's really important. Um, and, you know, as a whole, where we should be putting our investments and our money, we should be putting more investments in long-term energy storage. That has been the bottleneck. Um, as all of us know, 
um, just as, as one thing in the energy sector. So how we're calculating um, what is being uh, um, the GHG emissions that we can expect uh, and where are we where we're putting our money um, with respect to renewable energy infrastructure as well. Uh, when we talk about meeting our CLCPA goals, uh, and we say we're at 27%, from my understanding, about 24% of that comes from hydroelectric. So we actually haven't made it that far with respect to um, you know, wind and solar. So again, we need to look at those calculations and make sure um, that in all of those sectors, uh, we, are, we are advancing um, quickly. And the last thing I'll say is that we can't be increasing our statewide total energy consumption while trying to get our entire grid onto renewable because then we're creating a moving target. Um, so I think that you know, these applications really should be looked at in, in, as a whole package. Um, and if we are creating that moving target, then we're going backwards against our CLCPA. So I'll end there, it's, it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, Assemblyman Otis. Well, I, I'm, I'm not gonna repeat uh, the, the wise comments of my predecessors there. I would add two things. Uh, number one is emissions. And if we're going to reduce emissions, we're going to have to take out of the picture some of the emissions generators. And so that's going to be some tough decision making, some tough, tough planning. And I think this is something that the legislature is going to have to come up with a rational strategy to help us meet those goals. And uh, the second piece of it is um, increasing um, um, demand for electricity in places that are maybe uh, questionable. And this is where the cryptocurrency mining issue becomes a paramount issue um, uh, as a threat to our meeting our climate change goals, because you now have in this one form of cryptocurrency authentication called proof of work, a tremendous energy demand that we, we have not had to meet, we have not had to create energy to do this activity. This issue is being raised in China, it is being raised in Europe, it is being raised around the United States. It's not just a New York State issue, but we're not gonna meet our climate change goals if whether it's a cryptocurrency proof of work mining today or some other kind of new need for energy that maybe we don't really need that someone invents five years from now. We used to have something called demand side management in, and I'm going back 30 years in the world of energy and the environment was the concept that we would, uh, we didn't have to build a new power plant if we can reduce demand. And that principle still is uh, something that the public service commission works with and our energy policies work with, but we have lots of new increases of demand and some of them are just inevitable as it relates to technology. We have to um, make sure that where we have new needs for electricity, they are needs that are, are justified. We have to find ways to reduce needs in other areas and, and, and really question um, any kind of new activity that is, is creating a new demand for electricity. We have a situation where there's now an interest in reopening closed coal and, and natural gas power plants, um, not to serve consumers, but to meet this proof of work mining um, activity. We need to take a close look at it. Otherwise we will never meet our uh, very aggressive climate change goals that the legislature passed in 2019. Okay. Um, so I have another question. Um, that says, and again, I, this could be answered by uh, anyone or all of you. Is there appetite within the state to recognize the plethora of emerging contaminants other than PFOA? And they uh, have included a, uh, a link to an article uh, coming up from Tompkins County. That's in time, just pulling it up for a second. It's entitled Emerging Contaminants, Pharmaceuticals and Personal Care Products. I guess that's just part of, part of the issue. So is there anyone there that would like to uh, tackle that question? I'm happy to on that one. Um, first off, it'd be important to point to Senator Scoofus's bill that was passed this year, you know, in both houses awaiting the governor's, which drastically increases the amount of contaminants that would be emerging contaminants that would be tested for. 
you know, going to actually the contaminants coming out of pharmaceuticals or personal care products. I think that's what's really important to look at the source. We passed a bill, you know, the other prior year dealing with 1,4 dioxane and personal care products and to really, they're just going down the drain into the water sources and really polluting it or flame retardant. So I think it's a combination of, you know, looking at ways to definitely increase testing of what we're doing for emergency, you know, emergency contaminants so we know what's in the wells, but secondarily, like actually cutting off the faucet of some of these more dangerous chemicals through, you know, their direct sources. Anyone else like to comment? I would just like to add that, you know, we do need the measurements, but then we also need to uh, define uh, the maximum levels uh, that um, above which then uh, uh, um, entities would be considered um, liable to uh, to do cleanup. Um, so there's there's levels um, beyond uh, just knowing what's in our systems, but we're not even there. So I, I would absolutely agree with what Ashley's saying that that first piece is so um, is so critical uh, because then it can help us start the cleanup and also to hold those who are doing the, the contamination uh, responsible, um, you know, even difficult ones, right? Point source, point source and non-point source. Um, if we can identify them, that, that's really, really critical, um, you know, for, um, as I said, holding us accountable, holding entities accountable. Okay. Simon, just, just quickly also, you know, there are consumer products that we, we need to look at more closely Roundup, for instance, you know, a known carcinogen, an endocrine disruptor um, that has been, the active ingredient has been banned in the EU. Uh, courts have held um, Bayer liable for billions of dollars. Um, we have passed legislation to ban it from public land, state-owned land, but, you know, we need to really take a closer look at some of these bad actor chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, um, and, and you know, readily available science has, has looked at a lot of this stuff. Pesticide Action Network um, is just one of, of several groups who does work on this. So, you know, these are forever chemicals that, that really do a lot of damage to folks. And so I, I think you will see an appetite, um, you know, measured and prudent and, and based on science that we're going to need to take an approach in the legislature um, in the absence of the federal government regulating some of these chemicals. I'm going to throw one other thing out there that I think is really important because environmentalists and, and farmers so often get pit against each other. Um, and and it's, it's unfortunate. We really are on the same, we are all stewards. And part of the reason is, is because you know, farmers have been stripped bare. Um, you know, they work 17 hours a, a day and uh, they get about eight cents on the dollar of what the, the value of the food that they produce very often. They don't control the prices. They've been regulated, um, you know, significantly, which, I, you know, I'm not opposed to regulations that are really important, but if we are going to ask them to be part of the climate solution, we should be funding it. If there are capital investments that need to be made to the infrastructure to help them create sustainable agricultural systems, and they are already, um, you know, if we have a middle people, middlemen, right? We have a system where the seed companies, the pesticide companies, um, right, like big ag companies, that's, those are the people making the money. Not necessarily in New York State, we don't have those massive huge farms of 500 hit 500,000 head of cattle um so we need to work with them uh and help fund those investments um and if if we are saying we need to remove neonics for example which i think we absolutely do then we need to work with them for alternatives and if we know the ag the alternatives are sustainable ag practices then we need to work with them and help them if that means that we are providing grants or subsidies then that's what we need to do because um, the, 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 the finances are not there if they are already stretched that thin. I have, for example, one farmer who just to pay his bills had to add 200 head of cattle um, to the 400 that he had. And that was just to cover the bills. If they have to get bigger just to pay their bills, something's wrong with our system. Um, and that was to cover some of the investments that were required to reduce the amount of runoff 
uh, into the surface water in the area. So increasing the cause of the, the contaminants into the water in order to address the cost of the contaminants in the water, something's broken in that system. Um, so I just wanted to add that, that those investments are needed. Any other comments with that question? I'd like, I'd like to just weigh in. Uh, I uh, would observe that in the last uh, uh, half decade or so, uh, the personnel within the DEC has been reduced by approximately one third. A dramatic uh, disinvestment into the capability of the watchdog and the regulator uh, agency uh, for the environment in our state. Each year when we hold legislative hearings and uh, I get a chance to ask the commissioner, do you have enough personnel to carry out uh, the uh, mission of the, of the department? He answers, yes, oh yeah, we, we don't need any, anything uh, else. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm really uh, disturbed by that. Uh, that is a falsehood. That is a falsehood. That is repeated annually. And as a consequence, when the legislature, when we in the legislature are asked, are you willing to do more? Uh, the answer uh, is yes, we are willing to do more but we're also willing to put money into the budget for those individuals who can make sure that there is a follow through on any new laws that we pass. Here's the problem. If we just add money after the commissioner says we don't need it, what we have experienced in the past is a budgetary gimmick. Uh, they, uh, the executive branch doesn't add the personnel. And at the end of the year, they say, see how much money we've saved through our uh, frugal practices of administration. Now, that is, uh, that is a, a part of the, of the problem here. Uh, we, we are uh, not uh, interested in being made fools of, but in answer to the question, are we interested in protecting the people who sent us? Absolutely, we are. So please be, everybody who's on this, uh, this uh, uh, Zoom, uh, please be aware that there is a need for a general uh, revolt against the falsehood that the agency is adequately funded and has enough personnel to carry out its mission. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Uh, the, we're, we're nearing the end of our time. We said we would close down around 7.45. So I actually, I'd like to ask a question uh, directed at uh, Steve, uh, but uh, certainly, uh, and it's actually a follow-up comment that uh, uh, that uh, 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 the, uh, member Engelbright just made about, uh, about the DEC. Um, I asked this of Steve because this is uh, something that actually affects uh, um, NISAC members uh, directly, uh, some of you uh, may recall that the state uh, in the, up to the 1990s funded uh, what they used to call LEAP funding, uh, and that money went directly into the pockets of counties uh, to establish environmental management councils. Uh, the, those, ca those councils have uh, been disappearing as, uh, as, as quickly as uh, oh, water off a hot pavement. And uh, one of our uh, goals as an association is to support the, uh, the, the existing uh, EMCs that are still uh, around, uh, but also see if we can get some money from the state to, uh, to uh, put back into the counties, because these are, these are essential agencies. That, uh, you know, we would, we had conversation has been on local, on the state level, but on the local level, we're, our, our association, by the way, is strong. We have, we have a lot of new members, it's, it's, it's expanding, but on the county level, they, they've collapsed. And so I asked Steve, uh, what's the, where's, where's, the, uh, where's the possibility of, of, of going to uh, the state legislature and say, look, this is important. We need to start thinking about uh, refunding counties to reestablish EMCs. Which Steve are you asking? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot there are two Steves. I was directing to Steve Otis. 
and anyone else actually, but I mean, uh, anyone else can answer it, but I just, uh, I know Steve uh, had, Steve and I go back to that era when uh, when we used to go and have, you know, multiple, many, many counties with EMCs. And now it's down to, I, we made a count, I think it's out of the 63 counties in New York State, there are 15 or 16 left. I, I think the challenge is, and that money didn't just go to EMCs, it also went to local conservation commissions. And um, I think that in some portions of the state, we, we've seen conservation commissions um, go away sometimes because the local elected officials don't really get it and don't really understand it, it's important. One of the things that kept them in the game in those years with the LEAP funding was um, local environmental uh, people on those boards could say, uh, keep our conservation commission going and we're going to get a little piece of basically state aid for that function. So uh, I, I think that there's, there's a need to revisit that issue with DEC and within the legislature. And, um, uh, but I, I think I'll toss that to Steve Engelbright to figure out how we can solve it since he's chair of the committee. But the, the, the impact is some of these committees are going away, maybe not on Long Island or in Westchester, but upstate, this is, uh, we've seen some of these committees close up uh, bringing back LEAP funding, which was not a lot of money. I mean, it was a small budget item, would probably help um, generate more of, of those uh, municipal boards continuing to exist. And Assemblyman uh, Engelbright. Well, I'd like to get uh, a sense of what kind of uh, annual investment uh, would be required to uh, uh, restore this. Uh, network to its uh, uh, full uh, potential. Uh, I would also just point out it is very, very important for uh, that matrix of involvement uh, to, to be as robust as possible. In the absence of that, uh, it isolates those of us who are in state government to talking to ourselves. Um, uh, it is uh, very important that we have uh, these uh, county level uh, constituencies and, and, and uh, administrative infrastructure and advisory infrastructure uh, fully engaged and providing us with feedback and uh, enabling us to, to have a network uh, to get uh, information disseminated uh, to the general populace of the state. So this is a, a critical part of, uh, of uh, what we need. And uh, if you can assist me, uh, I'm going to look into it. Uh, but uh, if any of you have information in terms of, of what kind of dollars we're looking at uh, and what the impediments have been uh, so that we don't have to relearn uh, where uh, you know, where the pitfalls and cautions are, uh, that would be helpful and I'd be appreciative. And I work with my colleagues, certainly. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to my colleagues uh, who are here, uh, Steve Bodis and uh, Pete Harkin, uh, Anna Kellis and uh, Ashley, uh, on behalf of uh, Todd Kaminsky. Uh, it is a, an honor to, to work with each and every one of you and, and, and your your offices. I don't want to close it abruptly if someone wants, because we, we're actually very close to the 745 mark. Is, is there anybody who wants to make a, a statement on any issues that were mentioned or, or talk about anything briefly? Because I'm, I would just I'm, add one last thing as far as outreach from the community. I, I, I don't, um, no one should underestimate the power of sending letters to legislators. Um, the one thing that I would recommend, uh, if NISAC uh, has a really clear vision of what EMCs did and what they could do and what they have been unable to do because of the lack of funding and the request, um, that could be written and sent out by NISAC members uh, to their legislators requesting that that be included as a priority piece of legislation in this coming budget. Um, that can be really powerful if that is um, something NYSAC's board wants to put on a legislative priority list to send to legislators. 
um, that can also be very powerful. Uh, sending that to the governor um, to be considered in uh, the governor's one house initial budget. Again, very powerful. So you are an amazing organization, um, a coalition of, of people dedicated to the same purpose. Um, so, so bringing NISAC together uh, with it, that in mind and writing that letter and outlining and explaining it um, and having a clear ask at the end would be very, very powerful. Such a pleasure to be with you all. By the way, for anybody who's here, the people who are here on this call are some of my absolute favorite legislators that I have had the privilege to work with. This is, this is the cream of the crop here. So such an honor. I mean, you're muted. Simon, you're muted. He's on a roll. Okay. Saying nice things about all of us. Sure. Oh no. Uh -huh. Good night, Simon, everyone. Good Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Such a pleasure. Great to be with Take you. Take care, all. everyone. Thank you.